I love chaos. I'm doing 800 things. But you didn't start doing 800. That's right. And anytime I know I'm about to do so, I did VaynerMedia head down for five years to build a foundation. Right. To I do always things. tell people this. Hey everybody, it's Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 304 of the Ask Gary V Show, and I'm really excited uh, for this next guest, and we're coming in super cold. Uh, Nick Dio, my team, said, hey, I think Strauss should be on your show. I'm like, 100%. Uh, being invited to a, a, a Strauss party maybe nine years ago in the, in the tech kind of media scene was a super highlight for me, and uh, uh, some of you who know me know that Ben Lair is a very good friend of mine and earlier that, like three months earlier than that party, Ben and I, you know how like guys or gals get into like a meme of like something that's funny to them? Somehow a movie called Ghoulies became this like really funny thing. For, you know that movie? It's like a zeitgeist, like pop culture zeitgeist movie. Was it? I, don't, I thought it was well, like sure. a horror movie. Like, yeah, it was a little bit of both. Here's the punchline. Somehow at Sundance, this movie, Ghoulies, which I didn't know about, but then like in this weekend, it became the most important thing in my life. <laughs> so then a couple months later, we go to Strauss's house for this event or what have you. Somehow, we're, not a lot of people are left. And somehow me and Ben are just, somehow it gets referenced. Ghoulies, like we say something, it's like the inside joke, it's the meme. And Strauss goes, I made that movie. <laughs> which to this day is a top like 10. Strauss and I have not spent a whole lot of time together. We have a lot of mutual friends. I have an enormous amount of admiration from him from afar. We'll get, I'm gonna let him paint a five minute context of his career and then we'll do some Q&A because I think he's gonna help a lot of entrepreneurs. And then anything else Strauss on your mind, I'd love to know, you know anything that you wanna talk about. But the Ghoulies thing is a top 10 moment. Like, like f from the heat I think everybody can associate with this. You have friends, random shit becomes something you all talk about. For, this was like white hot. Like I basically said the word ghoulies 87,000 times over a one week period and then one week later, the man who fucking greenlit the movie. It was an amazing event. I don't, I don't know if you remember that stress. But I do remember the story. You know, I am probably gonna like ruin the whole thing. I made, I'm not sure you I made, made ghoulies. ghoulies. I made Goonies or Ghoulies and I never went to look to see which one was ours. After we had this no, conversation. No, no, but I think you had, you, if you made Goonies, you would definitely know it. Uh, you know, it Goonies is fucking the greatest movie of all time. Well, we made either Goonies or Ghoulies, but anyhow. We, I you think know, you made Ghoulies. All right, we made the worst. Whichever, yeah, you made Ghoulies. Whichever no, one was no, worse, that's news, the one Strauss, we made. Yeah. That's the one you okay, made. Okay, good. But yeah, we were not talking about Goonies, what I think is actually a top 10 movie of no, all no, time. No, I, I would have remembered Steven Spielberg. Making any, oh, no, we didn't make a Steven Spielberg yeah, movie. I barely met Steven Spielberg. You made Ghoulies, which is a movie that nobody under. Do What's going on? You got something? Yes, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a, anyway, nonetheless. That does look familiar. Stress, what, for anyway. everybody who's watching, there's a ton of entrepreneurs, a lot of business people, why don't you give everybody like a three minute like kind of comic book episode one, who, who you are, your career, a little bit about you. So on the career side, I always wanted to be in the entertainment business from growing up for no particular reason. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Boston and then New Jersey. Yep. And, uh, what part of Jersey? South Orange. Love it, very close to Wine Library. My my wine store was in Springfield, Short Hills. Yeah, very close. Very close, that. go ahead. Yeah. And uh I went, uh, I went to Wesley in undergrad. I went right to grad school out of college because I didn't want to work. And I figured a couple more years in school. Yep. And I was trying to figure out how to get into entertainment and a friend of a friend helped me get my first job in entertainment, which was a summer internship at Viacom. And uh, I worked there, you know, um, I had an amazing summer, met some people. That led to my first full-time job, which, is, which was at Columbia Pictures Television in sales. Uh, which wasn't really what I had in mind. I wanted to run a movie studio, but okay, it's a good place to start. <laughs> but flat out, uh, at that young of an age, you're like, that's what I'm gonna do. Oh, I knew run. I wanted to run a movie studio when I was five years old. And I, really? Yeah, and I didn't even. How did you even know that existed? How did I even, I didn't even watch, like I wasn't allowed to go to the movies particularly. I mean, you it was heard complete, parents talking about no, it? No, it was completely made up. My dad was a lawyer. So, um, no, no clue, uh, but I was committed to it. <laughs> so, uh, so wait, real uh, quick, just for one more time, because I need to rewind that. You're not sure, because you're young, how it got into your zeitgeist, but you immediately became committed to it. Yeah, I think I had some sense like that it was very uh, glamorous and, yes. and that you could be like- But at five, you cared about the girls already? Mm, I think it was more about the money. <laughs> <laughs> God, respect. One or the yeah, other, I, I guess wrong. Keep money. going. Yeah, little did I know. Yes. Uh, there are better ways to make money. Um, sure. Anyhow, I, I got recruited from Columbia to go to what, what was then the largest um, home entertainment company 
uh, Vestron. It's the early days of home entertainment. That's how long ago it was. And um, they were launching a motion picture initiative, and I became uh, the, the president of the company like nine months later. So I, How old were you at the time? I was 29. So Love I was it. right basically three yep. years out of school. Yep. And I mean, I didn't, to say that I didn't know anything is um, a gross understatement. I used to say my friends were like, this is a public company, um, and it was the biggest uh, independent. And they, the question was like, well, why would you be president of this company? And my, my answer was, well, I'm definitely not competent for the job. I'm definitely glad they gave it to me. So I, I did that. And, and, you know, at this point, you know, for a lot of people who are listening, like these days, 29, having a big company or a big job, not insane. Wasn't that either in no, the entertainment no. business? No, no. Okay. It's always been a business that gave young people opportunities early. No, it was definitely, I mean, you know, it was precocious, but um, first of all, an old person talking about what it was like to be young and successful is pathetic. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But no, yeah, you know, Barry Diller was in his early 30s when he was, when he was um, when he was chairman of Paramount, yep. so it was not not at all unheard of um, for successful people. Uh, that that went really well because the first picture I greenlit became the highest grossing independent film of all time, which I do remember, which was Dirty Dancing. And uh, then you know we and then we, that's that that you know we I made mean, we made a bunch of other movies. There were some that did very Ghoulies. well. Ghoulies. I remember this is yeah, how this conversation went down. With, no, no, you made Ghoulies. I'm, I'm, I'm I know you're committed to it, but I think it's just, I just don't want people like look it up. I know I people are going to be if it's not a Vestron movie. If it's not a Vestron movie. Like I completely made it up, and now Gary's like ruined I'm, the rest of his night. Stress, this is like literally um, my top. So 10 it either stories. was or was not distributed by Vestron, and I'm gonna. I just don't want to get the ugly email saying I made that movie. How could you take credit for it? Who so, made it? by Luca. But was it distributed by Vestron? Who, who, who distributed? Yeah, you got to figure. Or whose la- who catalog is in, in now? And then I could tell you. Anyway, okay, moving on. Well, we that went pretty well. I was recruited from there to become president of 20th Century Fox. Go ahead. Uh, and I was president <laughs> of Fox. That was a great run. We had a whole bunch of hits. Um, so after being in the movie business for seven years, I really sort of revised my goals, having met yep. you know, what I thought was a very long-term goal pretty yep. quickly. And I decided to revise my goals, say, I really want to do something that's in entertainment, but also highly entrepreneurial. And I sort of surveyed the landscape, and I said, and this is 1993, I said, you know, I think video games are going to become a huge entertainment business. And I went to um, a company called Crystal Dynamics, which was a pre-revenue video game company, is the first CEO, built that company up. And... Um, and then after we'd sort of got it to a critical mass, I left to do a turnaround of a huge record company back in the days when that wasn't an oxymoron. <laughs> that was called BMG. Yep. And that went super well. Took it from um, last place to um, nearly first place. And it would have been first place, but the f- one and two merged. So um, we were second place, but, you know, it was a great result. We had a lot of great hits and turned around the RSA label and other things. And then I revised my goals once again and said, okay, my goal now is to run a a diversified media company that's supercharged by digital technology. And that was... What year was that? That was 01. And that was considered somewhat out there. I mean, yep. people had gotten the memo on digital technology, yep. but I was always seen as the new media person. And I kind of... And this had, was post-April 2000 where things melted. Yeah, right? so that's right. And I and, and you saw that as the opportunity. I saw it as an opportunity. I mean, most people thought it was a terrible time. My view is there's never a good time. You know, there's no time when you're starting a business and you look around and say, wow, this is an awesome time. It's right. always hard. That's right. Uh, but it was it was the time when I was ready and I I'd, I was done working for other people. And so we started um, what has become ZMC. And we had just, you know, it's always fun to tell these stories. So we had no offices, no capital, no people, not really a business plan. And I started the business with $300,000 of my own money. Um, so for the last 18 years, we've been building up that company. And today, we have uh, assets in the many billions of dollars uh, and very little debt, great deal of cash. Uh, and we own a number of leading companies in the media, uh, communications, like? and uh, entertainment business. Well, our biggest company is Take-Two Interactive, which is a, a leading video game yep. company, the third largest, yep. uh, with titles like Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption. NBA 2K, Borderlands, Bioshock, Civilization, many others. Uh, we own, um, uh, uh, with partners, Nine Story, which is a leading Canadian-based animation company. Great great hits and great titles. Um, we have an investment in a company called Dynasty Sports. Uh, we own mm-hmm. IT Renew, which is a so-called ITAD company. It's a pretty arcane part of the data center space. Um, we're big believers in the growth of data. Um, uh, we own 
um, Canelo, which is a leading direct response television advertising company, AdThrive, a digital advertising company, and, and a number of other interests. And what's happening with your day-to-day these days within that ecosystem? Um, my day-to-day is I'm a partner at ZMC and I'm the chief executive of Take Two. So, uh, but, but Take Two is a part of ZMC. So we have the, I have the luxury that I, I'm able to both invest and operate in the media Love. business. And I am able to, you know, our entire thesis is, around, is based around the notion that technology will continue to transform and inform media Everything. and entertainment. <laughs> And we only invest behind that thesis. And the reason that we've never suffered a loss and we've been able to grow a very significant business from nothing, uh, at least so far, is because we don't look at, you know, we don't look at what's happening tomorrow or next quarter or in a, a year. Money. We look 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And so far, we haven't gotten it wrong. So in 01, people in our business, and we did have access to capital or we couldn't have bought these companies. Uh, people in our business were buying newspapers, and consumer yep. magazines. Yep. And that was sexy. And appealing, we didn't we didn't do those deals because we thought print was compromised, and of yep. course we were right. Uh, we did, however, buy an online market research company before that was sexy, and obviously took over a video game company in '07 that was very nearly bankrupt. And the, the perception was that company, you know, was had no chance of making it. That company's market cap today is uh, uh, is about ten billion dollars, a little bit more. What's so. um. What's your what's what's kind of most exciting you right now as you look out five, ten, fifteen years? I think this is just the beginning. So for a lot of people, a lot of people think that, and I just heard this at a, at a conference, you know, we've kind of established what the internet can do. We've kind of established what digital technology can do. It's all going to settle down. And now, you know, the, the move forward in digitally driven media will be evolutionary, not revolutionary. I completely disagree. I think the next 30 or 40 years will be the most exciting time that the media business ever has ever seen. And you will see it in every part, whether it's B2B, which we're in, or B2C, which we're in, or pure entertainment, which we're in, uh, or infrastructure, which we're in. And the reason I believe in that is, uh, is, is several history. fold. First, well, first that's is why you history, believe right? It. Because I think it was But honestly, the, right? Yeah. I mean, the, like, that's the answer. Yeah. In the 1880s, you know, the, the head of the U.S. Patent Office said, I think pretty much everything has been invented. That's it. Um, so, you know, you just I just know what humans do. Yeah, we just keep inventing. Either either th- their framework of perspective doesn't allow them to historically understand the context or they are financially invested in the outcome that comes out of their mouth. And often frankly emotionally invested. 100%. You know? Cuz re- everyone's financially invested in staying ahead of change. Uh, it's more emotionally invested. Yeah, change but, scares a lot of people. But I think you'll people. appreciate this, right? Like to me, I'm of course financially invested in all the things I do. However, because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm putting my money where my mouth is versus hoping that the exit, that the thing maintains for the next 27 months because I need to sell my stock at 27 months and go do what I want to do personally after that. Yeah, what a horrible way to live. By the way, whenever people give me a story like that, I'm like, see, here's the problem with that plan. You could walk outside and get hit by a truck tomorrow. You gotta be careful about delaying things for that. So anyway, uh, I think, you know, if you believe in Moore's Law, which I do, uh, you believe that whatever uh, data consumption you want to project for five years from now, aggregate, data consumption, you're wrong, it will be more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, you want to project what devices will look like. So Nick's holding an iPhone, I don't know which one, looks like a nine. Um, if it's mine, it's new. All right, or a 10. Um, <laughs> I mean, so that, that form right. factor uh, in 10 years, we'll look back on that form factor and we will think it's really funny. Um, looking at more. a couple cameras in here, these form factors will look really funny in 10 years. I just don't understand um, how people don't understand. It's history. Right. So do you know how rad as fuck the Walkman was? I know you do. Yeah, of course. I mean, like it was just like the crazy. You like, couldn't believe it. Yeah. The Razor phone was right. the single most important status item. Right. Of, Seth, you're old enough. I'm impressed. Right. Like, yeah, people are are unbelievably confused about how it actually works. So what we do, you know, is we look at the world uh, and we try to think about where that's going to be in five yep. or ten years, and then, you know, to the point about preservation uh, versus, you know innovation or disintermediation, we gotta be the ones to disintermediate ourselves. 100%. Uh, and that's a very hard task. But if you're worried about cannibalization in your core business, you should be the one cannibalizing your core business or someone else will do it for you. The Something I said to a buddy a long time ago that I use a lot, and it was the first time I said it and I'll never forget, I said, look, I'd rather put myself out of business than have somebody else do it for me. Exactly. It's exactly right. Yeah. And when, we, when I got to the record business in 94, the first thing we did was launch 
websites, which was innovative, right? and start thinking about how we can do digital distribution. By the yeah. way, we didn't do such a great job, but we were trying really hard. Yeah, but, I mean, so we weren't days, surprised right. when the Napsters came along. We were prepared for it, and how, we were best think, positioned than anyone. How do you think anyone. about blockchain? Forget about Bitcoin and all that stuff. Blockchain. Look, I, I think the notion of a, a widely distributed network you know, for computing is fine. The problem with the blockchain technology is, so far anyway, in for for you to create the additional nodes, you have to create an incentive for people to create the nodes. That's right. And so far, the incentive has been currency. That's right. And so if you have something that on the one hand has no owner and is highly distributed, on the other hand, has no built-in incentive, it's a bit of a question. The internet had a built-in incentive, which is, I want to express myself, yep. or I want to transact, uh, or I want to have you come see something. It was human. Um, but it's hard to know in the absence of uh, currency how you're going to make the blockchain work. And then when companies talk about it, I'm convinced, you know, when big, big, big companies start, I mean, people talk to us in the game space about it all the time. When I apply blockchain technology to the video game business, I'm like, please tell me how that works. Be, and, and it's not yeah, sarcastic. No, no, I get I'm it. very interested. You just know that they're putting right. hyperbole around a statement. Yeah. And I, so, I agree with you And 100%. so right now, like, do I believe in cryptocurrency? I don't. I know there are plenty of people who yeah. do. My attitude is, um, I believe in speculations. They exist all the time. Of course. But anytime a so-called currency goes from $10 to $20,000 to $3,600 in the space of like my recent memory, <laughs> that's not a currency. That's something else. It's not a currency. Um, so, and, and for people who transact outside a legitimate economy, they don't really care because their margins are so huge that what they care about is private transactions. Yep. Uh, but for the rest of us who have like, I have a really high margin in most of my businesses, but I don't have a sufficient margin to offset that kind of currency swing. I understand. So I'm not a believer at all in cryptocurrency. Um, I what think, about sports betting? You know, I'm a huge believer in sport. Well, how do you, I mean, first of all, it's a little late in the day since the US government already said we believe in it. Yep. We're taking it from the, gover the federal government saying yes. it's okay yes. to the states regulating it in a yes. way that works be complicated. And you've got a I, very powerful- I grew, up, I grew up in the liquor business. Right, so so you know. between cannabis and sports betting, two things in the macro I deeply believe in. Right, but micro is different. And so you've got massive lobbies, very powerful lobbies, uh, who've proven, by the way, that they can affect uh, legislation of late, um, who have Not a- Not just of late. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, Right, but in the casino business yes. where, well, so what do I believe? That if you're already in the casino business in the US, will you be able to engage in broadly distributed, digitally driven sports betting? Yes. Do I believe that we, as a non-regulated, non-gaming company, can take our sports titles and turn them into gaming opportunities. Um, it would be wonderful to believe that, and I'd be, you know, if if I were in the business of promoting our security publicly, I would say yes. I think the answer is that the opportunity may exist, but there are a lot of regulatory hurdles. Yep, there are there are obviously far fewer of them internationally. Talk to me about. Actually, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm curious about. So I've been really enjoying, similar to blockchain and cannabis and sports betting, the notion of esports teams. Watching a lot of people deploy the logic around something is, you know, this is where I get interested. I think this is from afar and then, you know, I'm, it's very clear to me listening to you. There's a lot of things that we cross over and agreeing on. I'm fascinated by people's inability to synthesize things in lieu of what they hope or emotionally or financially want to happen. Watching people deploy esports strategies in today's environments, fascinating because much like what you did to whoever says to you, we're gonna do this blockchain thing, I always say the same thing. I'm like, please explain to me why you think League of Legends is like the Major League Baseball system. Right. And when you get into even a basic first question yeah, and you, wa you watch people dance in front of you, what, what, you know, now that I've got a better framework of how you process, and it's probably why I like you, you know, what's your take on on the esports ecosystem around the IP holders versus how the teams think they're going to conglomerate the power? So we're in the business, right? Yep. So we and we eat our own cooking. Yes. But our view is that, like major sports, well, we believe in esports. There are yes. Two hundred fifty million people who watch esports. Uh, there are a whole bunch of people. You're play preaching. Them. So for sure, it's real. It is, however, the League of Legends business. And it's a billion dollar business. Yeah. And in our world, video game business alone, never mind the media business, never mind the sports business, video game business is $130 billion a year currently. Yep. Esports is a billion dollars. Yep. It's a teeny little business and the bulk of the market is League of Legends. And I say that as someone who's a competitor. We have the NBA 2K League. Yep. So uh, I think there'll be somewhere between three and seven powerful esports that will develop in the same way that there are between three and seven professional sports leagues that truly matter. Uh, you know, you got 
you got football, you yep. got baseball, you got soccer, especially So you worldwide. believe some of these IPs will come out, really lock in. And absolutely, will create. And then will become. And they'll become right. very valuable. Yep. And do you think teams will be able to sit on top well, and play in all of them, the so, individual? So I, I don't see a world, and this is perhaps wrong. Yeah. I, it's, this is speculative. Where you the can, good news is, for all the things we've been right about, we've been wrong. Yeah, many times, right? Yep. And what I say to people, actually, and ask my advice, especially when they're entrepreneurs, is uh -huh. this is one person's advice. But if you ask the great entrepreneurs, if when they talk to people about their ideas, people all said, high five, that's awesome. That didn't happen. So you shouldn't listen to my ideas. If you truly believe you should go do it. But in the case of esports, I have to eat my own cooking. I'm yes. betting on, I'm paying for it. Yes. So what we said is, look, People love playing NBA 2K. It's the biggest sports title in the U.S. Yep. Has been for years. Uh, people love competing in NBA 2K. They're doing it anyhow. Yep. So wouldn't it be sensible to have yes. teams that compete at NBA 2K and then uh, a broadcast, if you will, we're on Twitch, yep. those games? That seems to stand to reason. And so that's why we're going for it. Do I think those teams should be... Um, both NBA 2K and, and League Overwatch, of Legends League and, and Overwatch. Overwatch. And next There's no real analogy for that in professional sports. I'm a little skeptical. I think if you want to be the best NBA 2K you know, player. Deion Sanders might just pop out of the side here. Yeah, you know, know, it's possible. And it's yep. a different skill set. No question. But I think if you want to be the best NBA 2K player, you're probably not also going to be the best Overwatch player. Do you? Th what I think is most interesting about what you're saying to me is will they bake? Will three to seven titles bake? Or because of the notion of the framework, different, different than creating a ball-centric sport, which is what we're coming from, where literally, to, I mean, look, EA just has, you know, has a hit in a short, like, will it be more like the movie and television business where in perpetuity, there will be games that capture three, four, five years? Or are you saying Marvel? Star Wars, you know, there's. I'm that's, more saying that. I know that's what you're it's saying. it's a sport. But and in Marvel and Star Wars, there still will be a Forrest Gump. There still will be, yeah. right? And so it's gonna be, it'll be interesting if, if I'm actually, just literally as you're talking, I'm like, ooh, so maybe it bakes three to seven, and or maybe it bakes six, and you're always in an environment where another four are always getting five year runs and seven year runs versus the kind of five that get a 40 year run. I don't know. I, I'm skeptical only because Team play and watching team play seems to cluster around these very ancient forms. But you know what? This could be an example where you know history just isn't a guide of the future because after all, League of Legends does not look like hockey, football, sure. baseball, or you know yeah. soccer. That's right. So it we, it remains to be seen. Um, I feel very obviously very good about our bet because yes. I feel like you, it's right in the pocket. You're doubling down. Yeah, you're, you know, yeah, yours it's is, right in the pocket. Yeah. But that's it. It's really days. I apologize. We've had one season. If you're watching on Instagram, Facebook, put in your phone numbers. Calvin's ready to call. We we have to give you an opportunity to get some access to this wonderful thinking. You ready for doing one? You got one? Go ahead. Yeah, you can ask personal questions too, not just business questions. I like business questions. Is there anything you want to talk about that's personal? No, no, anything you bring up. <laughs> you, know, no, I, I I, you know, I like, I like, I like trends, I like macro thinking, I love history. Yeah, you know, I, I like the way you're kind of storytelling because it's contextual, which is, I bet on context and human behavior. Yeah. It's not super complicated. And I'm patient. We are unable to complete Who your call this? at this time. Mel, you fucked Please up. Try. We're gonna go to the next call. <laughs> uh, actually, speaking of that. Not, speaking of Mel? No, not yeah. Mel, and hold this for a second. Speaking of some of our similarities, how much do you get excited about analyzing Things that are popping in culture. Is that something you give a fuck about? Things that are popping yeah, in like, culture like if all I, the time. Cool, so that makes sense to me based on yeah, how we're talking. All the time. Give me something, is there anything that's on your radar right now that you're like, huh, or hmm? You what's know, the I think, or what's the last thing, whether so the it's last, slime with nine-year-olds or K-pop, like what's in the hmm? I would say hmm has been the most recent uh, social media apps that kids are using. TikTok? In, yes, okay. that I, had not, I was not familiar with. And but so you know I, that's musically reincarnation of yes, sure. Exactly. So, so what I have thoughts. is a, I have a, a young guy yep. who every month comes in and shows me what's happening in popular that. culture that I wouldn't have run into. Smart. Uh, and Stress, on that on that note, this is actually something I think I know. He's as one well. of our interns. He's great. On that note, you've done. That By is, the way, he had to delete ahead, the please. inappropriate stuff before he showed me. Respect. That, you know? <laughs> he thinks you would give a shit. I, I love. He's that. confused. That was that was great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You. You do a good job of that, right? Like, are you, you, you do have, you know, it's, it's funny you just said, I don't know what that triggered me, but it seems like all of a sudden my brain just jiggered and I feel like I've come across over the last 10 years, three individuals that talk about spending time with you or having lunch with you or breakfast with you. You're doing that game, huh? 
I spend about 25% of my time coaching and mentoring people at all stages of their career, all stages, including people who are older than I, but it does tend to skew younger. And, um, and I didn't do it for any other reason, except that you know I make light entertainment for a living, and I really thought it was important to find some way to make a difference. And it seemed that I could do came, that. It came native and, to you. And I saw I had an open door. And when you have an open door in a business that's hard to break into, like entertainment, you know what? People come People in. People come. And uh, so ready when you are. I did it. I got to tell you, I didn't do it for this reason. But I've, I've developed an extraordinary collection of friendships from doing it. Of course. So it's, it's actually been amazingly worthwhile. And after all, that's how you and I met. Because yeah, Ben course. brought you to my house. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Who's this? So TikTok's on your radar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And something next month will be. What's interesting about that in the macro is it's it's people using something to help them create. Hello, yeah. hello. I agree. Uh, who's, who's this? Andrew. Andrew. Yes, you're Andrew, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm Gary. Strauss is here too. Hey, Gary. Say hello to oh, Strauss. Man, this... Hey, Strauss. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, just about to take my daughter home, but. Uh, had to put my number up there. Had to tell you, um, Gary, you've been an inspiration to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate it. Is there anything we can um, answer? Anything on your mind? Anything we can answer for you? So, I just created. Well, let me start off. Um, been an entrepreneur almost since I was like nineteen. Okay. I'm gonna say. Okay. Uh, my father's been a hustler. You know, he sold pots. He sold. <laughs> water filters, everything. Like um, he's always been telling me, you know, always, you know, hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, Where'd you grow up? So, oh, I, yeah, as I was, I, well, with, in New York. Love it, keep going. New York, New York. So, um, one day I sat down with my sister. Uh, we actually opened up a liquor store. I know a York. lot about that. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so... How's it going? You know, I, I do it. So wait, how, break actually, this down for not, me. You and your sister just sit down in the, in the sofa in the living room like, let's open a liquor store and boom, you open the liquor store? We, we've always kind of thought about it. <laughs> okay, and good. actually a place, a place opened up. That went out of business and, like, and you just took it. it over. No, no, we just started from scratch. We didn't know love shit it. about I love it. liquor stores. So how's it going? So, um, it's doing so, so not so good. Why? Not so good. Why? What's your hot take? What's your early? How long have you had it? Five years. What do you? What's your read? So not your hot take. You're like educated guess. Five years in, what's the struggle in your opinion? Um, to be honest with you, just a lot of things. Just you know, uh, loss of customers. Uh, just maybe increase, maybe us not buying enough liquor, you know, to, it's, to, for, uh, for cost be, and everything. Are, is your, yeah. you know, one of the tough things about the liquor business in the Northeast, uh, specifically in New York and New Jersey, is it's much more of a price market than people realize. It's hard to differentiate yeah. when people know what they want, especially if you sell liquor and beer. One of the reasons I took my dad's store from Shoppers Discount Liquors to Wine Library was very quickly as a 15 year old, I said, oh shit. I am not convincing this 80 year old woman that just walked in that's been drinking Johnny Walker Black for 52 years to try some other scotch that I could make more money on. And the same thing became real for me of like truck driver Johnny, he's fucking drinking Natty Light. Like it's hard for me to move him. On the wine side, there was this exploratory kind of, I don't know anything about wine, I drink Kendall Jackson and Santa Margarita and Silver Oak, but I don't, I'm very insecure, maybe you know something else, what's this wine spectator and Robert Parker, and I found my creative opportunity, and then once I understood winemakers mattered, I started painting pictures, and what picture painting yeah. allowed me to do was split up the business. I sold everything everybody knew about at cost. I literally sold Budweiser. Schaefer, uh, you know, Doors White Label Scotch, Santa Margarita, everything that people drank that they knew, that everybody knew, every brand, I sold at dead cost. And then I spent every single cent of my energy life that you would walk in because you knew we sold Budweiser at cost or more importantly, specifically to wine. You knew that we sold Kendall Jackson yeah. and Santa Margarita at dead cost. They were the two most important items. And I would 
intercept you through my merchandising or actually being on the floor at first because we were a small company and I would try to story tell to you why Santa Margarita Pinot Grigio at $12.99 was overpriced, which it was, which having truth on your side was great and why you needed to try this $9.99 Pinot Grigio but oh by the way I was making $4 a bottle on that versus zero on the $12.99 and then when you tasted it and you, and you liked it better or at least in the same ballpark, I started building trust. You're in a commodity business, you have to create a differentiator. Yeah. Well, Instead of standing behind the register yeah. and waiting for people to buy shit. Honestly, yeah. I, I'm not scared to sell it. We're about to sell it, actually. Okay. I'm moving on to. I'm not scared to move on to next projects. You know, I'm a local. I actually, you know, do a little bit of everything. I sell jewelry. I'm a DJ. I'm a local DJ. Look, and I'm all about being me. a renaissance man, and I'm one. But one of the reasons the liquor store might be fucking failing is because you're doing 87 things, which means you're doing no things. Yeah, you got to focus. Yeah. Especially early in a career. No, yeah. that's a good point. Like to me, yeah. listen, I'm, 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 a, I, I love chaos. I'm doing 800 things. But you didn't start doing 800. That's right. And anytime I know I'm about to do so, I did VaynerMedia head down for five years to build a foundation. Right. To I do always things. tell people this: we got a lot of lines of business now. We got a bunch of companies, Andrew? eight companies. When people Andrew, say, "Thanks for calling, brother. Good luck. When Hit me on the DM." No, wait, hey. Oh, can sorry, I, Strauss. Go ahead. Can I? Can I? Can I mention this one thing that Go. I, I want to tell you? This is what I called about. I just started this new application that I just made. It's up on the iOS store. Um, it's for local DJs and local photographers. I feel like this is just gonna be the greatest thing. You of know? course, because um, you're gonna build a two-way marketplace to help people be discovered, right? Yes, yes. The hardest so business in the world was, that everybody wants to build. That's why eBay and Uber yes. are trillion dollar companies, you know, but go ahead. <laughs> yes, my, so my question was, how, how do I gain the trust for my users to start signing up. You mean the supply? You, you mean know, the actual DJs, the actual, those people, or the consumers to find? Yes, that, no, just the actual DJs, because if, when they start signing, when they start signing up, I got they it. see that they gotta I got put it. in that bank, my, my that bank information. My intuition on a limited context, I have six minutes and 13 seconds into you, I would go hand-to-hand yeah. combat. Go hand-to-hand combat, okay. localized, DM, meet people, shake hands, kiss babies, get those first 50 to 70 people. People forget that Uber was in San Francisco for well over a year, almost two full years before they even came to New York, right? Everybody wants yeah. to expand. Just win, where do you live right now? Uh, New York and Yonkers. Yon- win fucking Yonkers. One step at a time. I'm already impressed that you got into the app store. A lot of people talk, they dream. I appreciate the execution. I'm not sure how you did it, build yeah. this and that. Win fucking Yonkers, win Westchester. Let's just start there. And how do you do that? Okay. Fucking go to Google and go, and go to Instagram and use hashtags and find the 50 to 500 local players in your market and go buy them some french fries. Yeah. Give them a free bottle of booze. Figure it the fuck out. Hand to hand combat. I wanna, say, I, wanna say the, I wanna say the name to my- to Go my ahead. Before I leave. We'll give it to you, go um, ahead. It's Evently. Evently? Yes. Good name too. All right, brother. E-V-N-T-L-Y. Yep, E-V-N-T-L-Y. I love the hustle, brother. Good luck. Good luck. All right, thank you. Strauss, you were saying, you no, give I, so I, a lot of entrepreneurs will come and say, you know, I want to have, uh, I don't want to just do this thing. I want to do this thing and then I want that division. I want that plan. And they'll, they'll outline three or four goals at once. And you know, what I say is I've never seen an entrepreneur, not once, who started with more than one thing. I've seen plenty who Ooh, having later. started one thing and made it successful, moved on. So I would say, you know, as entrepreneurs go, Bill Gates, pretty good entrepreneur. He started with desktop operating systems and they stuck with that for a long time. Long time. Long time. Yeah, actually this is a good segue because this is something I'm passionate about. It might be a good place to take kind of our back half of this, of this interview. Entrepreneurship. It's become a very different thing than what you and I knew it to be for a very long time, right? I was a bad student, which was unusual for immigrants from the former Soviet Union, all the kids, you know. I, I took a lot of L's along the way, um, because I just couldn't be anything else. I, ju- I just didn't have it in me. Baseball cards or anything else, then wine, blah, blah, blah. You know, I literally sat sophomore year in high school and would read the Wine Spectator cover to cover, and that's why I got D's and F's in science. And so it was just, it wasn't viable. You know, I was this poor student, and, and I was doing all these, I was making $3,000 a weekend selling baseball cards, but every parent of my friends and every teacher told me I was gonna be a loser. There wasn't even the framework in 1990 to 89 to see the world through an entrepreneur's eyes. We are very much not there now. That's right. We are now in the other place where career students have decided they're gonna be the next Zuckerberg, right? What, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on 
the state of the union of entrepreneurship through your eyes based on the way I framed it up? Are you, well, I mean, what do you world, happening? It's easier to approach the world. I mean, we just talked to someone who owns a liquor store who just got an app in the app store. Yep. And, you know, as you point out, maybe if he goes and hustles and promotes it, it could take off. Yeah. Pretty crowded place, the Very. app store. You know, thousands and, of and new apps. And the joke sometimes. I was making, I was just kind of having a little fun with you, but trying to educate two-way marketplaces. I mean, that is 9,000 times yeah. a day in my DM and email. I'm gonna, because they. what I like is people scratch their own itch. They see the pain. They just don't realize how difficult it is to build a monster in that space. But nonetheless, so, so I think you know the, it, it's always been hard to build a business that's highly successful. It's still hard today. I do think the world's a little more forgiving today of people who take non-traditional paths because of the cost of entry. Uh, no, it's just gotten a little more popular because you know really, really, really smart people like Mark Zuckerberg don't complete college and go that's on right. to be hugely successful. But in fairness, Bill Gates didn't finish that's Harvard. Right. You know, he's my age. So um, I, I, I think. The upfront the, costs to get in the game, though, have changed. Yeah, the upfront cost is way lower. And the, the scale the, of the end, yeah. to get to the end consumer. But the opportunity for great success is yes. still the same. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, and what about micro, you know, I apologize, micro success. Something I'm getting outrageously passionate about, and really the book that put me on the map, you know, a lot of people are like, hustle, and it, they take shots at me. I'm like, did you read it? Because really what I'm saying is, my intuition is 2008, is the way the internet's going specifically on social is there's a lot of people who can make 69,000 a year being thrilled, being an expert in Smurfs or selling jam, who are making 80, this was my thesis. You can make 88,000 having a job you don't love, or 120, or you can make 79, or maybe 140, being the foremost experts of Star Trek, and that's what played out. So that's for sure the case. Our company, AdThrive, allows independent publishers to make a great living. Um, some of them actually are immensely successful Makes and sense. can become huge. For some people, it's a difference between making $20,000 in their spare time and making $100,000 a year, which they can live on and live on nicely. Especially um, in stress. This is something that has to, happiness has to be talked about more. So I, I had lunch with Please. an entrepreneur today, and he's in the fitness space. And he, he had walked away from a very big and successful career as an actor to, be, to go into the fitness space knowing full well he would likely, almost likely person, permanently, make less money Happiness. because it pleases him. Happiness. And it's what he loves to do. And he's passionate about it and therefore he's great at it. And he's, it is his joy to spend his day in the gym, improving people's lives. And, and no, he's not living horribly because he's so good at what he does. Sure. You know, my feeling is, you're really, really good at what you do, generally speaking, you'll make a living. The other thing is most people, not everyone, most people are not, once they have food, clothing, shelter, and the ability to raise and educate their kids, most people don't care about incremental money in, in, term, in terms of what truly makes a difference in your happiness. Especially, some people do, no, some people do, by the most way, people don't. Especially if they can get into a place where they can deal with outside judgment That's right. and don't aren't so insecure that they need things to prove things to people exactly. usually they don't when they're self motivated. So one of the you know, when I coach people, the question I start with is, what is it that you want that you truly want? Not that other people tell you, you should want, not the not, not what you're trying to prove to somebody exactly. else. Exactly. What is it you actually yeah. want? And think about what that life looks like. Can I ask like. you a question? Yeah. For me it's very clear. I love the game itself. The process is so much more enjoyable than the trophy. Like do you feel like you're a process guy? Well, I'm very much, a, I'm an achievement guy, I've decided. Okay. I like a doing hard things. Yeah. And that's why if you look at what I do, yeah. like, I do turnarounds, I do yeah. really hard things in yes. media. Um, sometimes I think like I'm intentionally the guy walking up a hill with a backpack full of rocks and if one happens to fall out, I pick up another one. If I run into you, I grab your rocks too. So I'm not sure it's always the healthiest. I got it. But I like doing super hard things and then pointing, not to others, to myself, that I was able to do that. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, Maybe too much to me. Do I care about the money that comes with it? Yeah, I enjoy making money because it's fun to make money. It's certainly nice not to have huge financial constraints, and I don't want to minimize that. But does it does it motivate me day to day? No. Achieving interesting and hard things motivates me, and working in a field I love motivates yeah. me. I love media and entertainment, and I love working with creative people, which is how I spend about half my day. Um, so in the last two that, minutes here, that that really matters to me. What did we not cover, or what from your? Like, is there anything you'd like to talk about? Uh, I think I covered a lot of it. There are lots of things I like to talk about, um, but I think you sort of covered it towards the end, which is you know what are we all doing here? And it's tempting to sort of focus on you know are you going to be successful, or can you make it, or will the liquor store be successful? How do you have hand to hand combat to make your app successful? You know, I think the thing I like to talk about is stepping back from them, which is why are you doing this? 
And, you know, if the answer to the question is, yes, that worked out, then what's the question? Yeah. You know, if I say to you, you can you can have it, it's going to work, you know, it'll be what you want. How many people have actually thought about, well, what exactly is that? I would say the one thing that I'm, I'm super proud of is that when I was really young, I knew basically what I wanted my life to look like when I'm this age. And while, of course, I couldn't have predicted it perfectly, of course. It's, it's pretty close. It was, and the other thing is it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Couldn't agree more. But it, it is for me. And I think one of the reasons I feel some satisfaction is not because I feel like I crushed it, not like I feel like I figured it out, and certainly not because I'm the most successful person on earth. I don't feel any of those things. But I set out to have a certain life that would work for me both professionally and personally, and more or less, that's what I got. Man, I got to tell you, if when I tell people, after wishing people that I care about health, boy, is self-awareness the next thing that always populates. Because yeah. once you map that, stuff can get real interesting. Yeah, and, 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 and more peaceful. 100%. I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for having Thanks me. For us. See you guys. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my video on YouTube. I wanted to jump in here at the end because I'm working on a ridiculously important project for me and I have a funny feeling you can help. If you drink wine at all or know anybody that drinks wine at all, please go to empathywines.com right now and sign up for a subscription. Whether it's a three pack, whether it's a six pack, or whether it's a whole case of each for the year, if you drink 36 bottles of wine a year or give away 36 bottles of wine a year, please sign up for Club Empathy. This project means the world to me. I could really use your support.